Hi, good afternoon. My name is Bill Marion, Managing Director of Growth and Strategy at Accenture Federal. Just recently retiring as the Air Force's Deputy CIO. I'll be serving as your moderator today with our distinguished panel of, of speakers. Uh, I, I'll introduce them in a few minutes, but first would like to highlight what we plan to achieve in the next 45 minutes of your time with us. Uh, first, the title, Cybersecurity Melting Pot, Tech Vision to Workforce to Operations. As the name implies, uh, we're going to smelt quite a few areas together within the cybersecurity and operational lens. A vision of the tech forecast, hopefully elements of whole of government workforce enhancements, and last but not least, the operational goals and challenges we'll, we will drive together. Uh, many of, of on this session recognize the cultural, geographic, industrial, organizational, and workforce diversity of the Texas region uh, when it comes to cybersecurity. It, it truly is tremendous. And from industry like our Accenture Cyber Centers in Houston and San Antonio, to academia in UT Austin and San Antonio and Texas A&M Morales, uh, to startups, to state and federal, like Army Futures Command here and Army Air Force Cyber Command and nonprofits like FCA, Cyber Texas, Port of San Antonio and Cyber Patriot. Uh, most importantly, it's, it is that diversity that we're trying to fully enable to accelerate digital and cyber innovation. AI, ML, human-centered design, cloud computing, digital workforce empowerment, uh, not just as em emerging and critical trends, but truly mission accelerators. To that end, we'll lead with a couple of uh, minutes of intros, get straight to about 25 minutes of, of questions from myself, and then we'll pivot to about 15 minutes of questions from the audience. So please use the public chat window in the, stream, or in, in the application to bring your best and toughest questions into our esteemed panel. We'll be taking questions through the entire session, so please, please put, put, put those forwards. So with that, on to our distinguished panel. Uh, first off, Brigadier General Rob Edmondson, currently serves as the U.S. Army Forces Command Deputy Chief of Staff in G6. Major assignments including the 101st and 82nd Airborne Division, HUA, uh, Joint Staff Pentagon, Army Staff Pentagon, and Army Intelligence and Security Command. He served as the 38th Chief of Signal and Co Commandant of the Army Signal School, where he was responsible for the initial military training in professional military education for nearly 65,000 total force Signal Corps soldiers. Uh, he has commanded at every level. And frankly, I'm not sure what's harder, being a CIO or being a CIO uh, in an operational command like, uh, like Forcecom. So welcome, uh, Rob, to our panel. Second, we have Mr. Guy Walsh, founding executive director of the National Security Collaboration Center at the University of Texas, San Antonio. Guy has served in several senior positions in the DOD, culminating in key work in critical infrastructure, in the critical infrastructure domain, and also served as a command A-10 pilot during his Air Force career and an expeditionary wing commander. An operator in every sense of the word from airframe to cyber operations. So great to have you on board today, Guy. And then our third panelist, uh, co-founder and managing director of Cyber Strategies, uh, Mr. Bob Butler. Uh, longtime friend as well, but he served as senior officer and senior executive uh, ranging from commanding the Medina Regional Sig uh, Sig Security Operations Center, serving as Associate Director of the Joint Information Warfare Center, uh, and, and really culminating with the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Cyber Policy for, for the Department of Defense, and now as senior industry positions inside industry. Uh, Bob, too, has a wealth of military industry and civilian uh, expertise here that hopefully will mine as well. So welcome, Bob, to the, to the panel. So with that, gentlemen, thanks all for joining us uh, for your, with your precious cyber intellect and time today. Uh, hopefully this is engaging uh, for the audience and we can kind of cover a bunch of melting pot territory. Uh, we're gonna do this a little different. We're gonna frame a couple themes, do a couple speed rounds uh, and get your respective thoughts and backgrounds. So with that, let me, uh, let me just kick it right over to you, Rob. Uh, certainly uh, what's top of, of mind in the Forcecom arena with respect to cyber these days? Okay, Bill. Well, first of all, thank you. Uh, thank you for moderating uh, this panel and, and to Guy and Bob. I, I'm, I'm honored to, uh, to accompany you uh, on this journey for a wonderful 45-minute conversation that uh, hopefully will uh, help to enlighten all of us, especially those that have dialed in. Um, so in terms of what's on my mind here at Forcecom, I'm, I'm going to begin, though, by 
by saying, um, you know, as a reminder here that the, the views that I'm going to give you are going to be my views and not necessarily those of the department. Um, but as you pointed out, Bill, being a CIO of a force comm organization, an operational organization that frankly, when mobilized, and I didn't realize it until I got the job, that 87% of the Army in some way, shape, or form is going to touch forces command when they're mobilized. So that means there's a lot that is going on. And, uh, and what's on my mind with regard to cyber? Uh, well, you know, as a career communicator, um, especially living today in the operational force, uh, the, the reality, what's on my mind most is the reality that uh, we operate in a contested environment. And uh, wherein we had the days of open field running throughout the networks, today we have to balance everything we do with a healthy dose of, of blocking and tackling that we really, frankly, didn't have to talk about 10, 20, or so, sorry, so years ago. In order to do that blocking and tackling nowadays, we, we have to have a slightly different type of a workforce, and that's the civilian workforce as well as a military workforce. Uh, so frankly, we spend a, a fair amount of time discussing recruiting, training, developing, and employing and retaining the right type of skill set uh, for 2020. And uh, there's probably no better example of, uh, of how we are examining this challenge and meeting this challenge head on and, and maybe most importantly, changing the way in which we do business than to take a look at one of our cyber MOSs that we just stood up, uh, our warrant officers, uh, the 255 Sierra. And I'm not going to, you know, um, um, uh, cite too much military jargon. But I will share with you that uh, here's an example of where we stood up a critical need, a critical MOS. We frankly thought it needed a, a certain level of um, um, promotion prior to arrival into this new branch. And what we realized was that rather than establishing an artificial uh, promotion uh, floor before you could become a member of this new force, then what we really needed to do was just look at your skill set. Look at the table, look at your accomplishments, and quite frankly, uh, then build you into this new workforce and not use the old antiquated industrial age ways of promoting individuals, but maybe looking at your merit a little bit more than just your time in the seat. So uh, in terms of what I think about most and what's going on in Forcecom, it, it frankly is um, how do you operationalize the network? And with that, sir, thank you very much for the introduction. Very good, and thanks for joining today, Rob. Guy, let me turn it over to you. I, you, you are definitely smack dab in the middle of the melting pot and collaboration in the in the Texas arena. Uh, maybe highlight some of those areas for us, if you would, to kick off. Absolutely, Bill. And again, thank you for the invite. I know uh, uh, I was pleasantly surprised uh, about a week after you turned in the uh, uh, over the job up there at OSD, where we were working together uh, to get the call uh, and invite here. And also just the concept that uh, of what work working together between a lot of the folks up there in the Austin area where you're at now in San Antonio, uh, particularly for here in San Antonio, I will tell you that. Uh, and again, uh, here for my first year, uh, this, this week actually starts my second year here in San Antonio in UTSA working with uh, President Taylor Amy in the university. Uh, but what is, uh, I will say, unique about this area and makes it a little bit different is really what you talk about, that melting pot in the organization. Uh, from the first day uh, arriving here, and I think Bob Butler was actually one of the first ones to, to greet me when I came on board here and has been uh, tremendous in bringing me uh, uh, into that. But uh, same thing with the with the city of San Antonio here, Mayor Ron Nuremberg has uh, the NSCC and building this community and supporting uh, your previous speaker, Tim Hawk and the team out there. Uh, one of his top three goals, and it's continuously, he probably talks about it more than I do in terms of the NSCC and the School of Data Science. Uh, yesterday, we actually had the mayor's group uh, in our discussion, uh, working with that, working with the city. Uh, Juan Ayala, who runs the military veterans, uh, and Amanda Keemer, who runs the cybersecurity uh, for the mayor's group and others. And, and we have this continuous dialogue. So what I do tell you is that bringing that inter intersection and community approach has been absolutely tremendous. Uh, uh, here, as you know, in San Antonio, uh, we're big into the biotech and the uh, health and medicine with UT San Antonio, uh, working closely with the UT health systems uh, and the folks up there in Austin and across uh, UT systems. And that's very busy, obviously, with the COVID-19. Uh, but we've been very, uh, you know, it's been hot other than I'll say the touchers with three consecutive record days here in terms of building 
uh, that community. Uh, I'll probably start. Most of you are very familiar with the growth that's going on down around Tim Hawk and 16th Air Force with Port San Antonio. Uh, I do a regular, we have regular meetings with the team down there, Jim Pershbach uh, and Will Garrett and the team, Doug Monroe, or uh, sorry, Doug King uh, and David Monroe. Doug just came on board with the San Antonio Museum of Technology. And so we've built this regular and continuous uh, dialogue with the team down there that's been uh, very, very effective in ter terms of doing that type piece there. Uh, we also have uh, worked very closely with the military. On March 16th, I believe it was, we started a COVID-19 cyber task force. Uh, it was really intended to have that dialogue between our Joint Base San Antonio teams uh, and with uh, uh, DHS. We actually have about 10 or 12 federal partners. Uh, we developed this off of the Cyber LA labs and working with Department of Homeland Security, uh, the state, local, and territorial folks there. And so we have this continuous dialogue with Southwest Texas Fusion Center, uh, and a lot of our federal partners that are located here in San Antonio, that many people not be aware of with having Secret Service, a large piece of their technical group, uh, and obviously the 14 installations under Joint Base San Antonio. Uh, so, uh, and, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it really quick is the, the most recently over the last month, Joint Base San Antonio uh, was named as OSD's uh, Experimentation and Pilot Program for three different programs. Uh, two of them dealing with 5G. So we're one of the 12 installations uh, glow, uh, in the United States that is doing 5G work. We, uh, Joint Base San Antonio will be leading the effort on the cybersecurity or what we call core uh, 5G. And then also uh, we'll be leading the efforts here in the electromagnetic de defense initiative uh, run by JBSA and started by uh, the former AETC commander, Lieutenant General uh, uh, Killer, uh, Steve Foster. Uh, so hopefully uh, that gives you a quick idea of some of the melting pot issues that are going on here down in San Antonio. Absolutely, that's great. I think that'll tie well into Bob. I know you you co-authored co uh, kind of this three-step piece of, of transforming in this cyber area. Uh, probably a good good place to highlight some of those and the ties back to uh, what Guy was talking about. Yep, yep. Hey, thanks, Bill, and uh, a great panel. A privilege to, to join the group. Um, this was a, a piece that uh, I wrote with uh, former Assistant Secretary of defense, Frank Kramer, and it really was driven off of uh, you know decades of experience, both as a U.S. military intelligence officer, running PNL on the business side, being a practitioner um, as a chief security officer for a global data center company, as well as you know serving as the deputy assistant secretary in the Pentagon in space and cyber policy, and it's it's informed by uh, both previous work and current work with the Defense Science Board. Uh, the Army Cyber Institute, um, and specifically the Jack Voltaire program. We'll talk a little bit about that later on. And what is currently ongoing with the Cyber Solarium Commission. So as Rob was indicating, I mean, the, the world has changed, right? It's not just the pandemic. We saw that um, even prior to the pandemic, based on the increasing pace of the threat, uh, the homeland is no longer sanctuary. Uh, our deterrence and our, um, and our overall defense model was not working. Um, and the risk gap was growing. And so as as we reflect as I reflected on that with Frank, we said, you know, we need to change the model. And that's the title of the piece, cybersecurity and the need to change the model. And the three basic ideas inside of this is to build at one level to build a more resilient architecture and cover three different areas inside of that. Uh, one is uh, the idea, and I think you've already talked through this as part of the venue, is designing open, resilient, and zero trust architecture. I'm happy to drill down into that. Uh, secondly is uh, mastering the supply chain and building life cycle uh, program protection efforts, continuous risk mitigation activities. And the third is to embrace automation and AI enabled capabilities. That's the first idea. The second idea is this doesn't work without re rethinking through um, our partnerships and collaboration. So at four different levels, building active defense minded partnerships at the federal level, one, at the critical infrastructure, uh, commercial level, two, at the state level, three, and uh, fourth, at the international level, creating an international cyber stability board. To do that requires a lot of federal and private sector enablement, both in authorities and resources. And again, I'm, I'm happy to talk through that. And the third big idea, Bill, was this concept of continuous net assessment. We're in a great power competition. Um, uh, and in a great power competition, you need to know where you are, what relative advantage you have, 
against an adversary, uh, and you need to know where you are in terms of risk. So there needs to be a new concept and indications and warning for measuring the relative advantage and the relative risk, especially as we engage in campaign planning uh, in competition and uh, looking at conflict over time um, in order to understand our adversary and how to move uh, with advantage in this space. But again, I'm happy to chat more about any of the topics as we go through this. Thanks again for the, uh, the invitation to be a part of this group. Yeah, that's that's phenomenal. Uh, appreciate the, the niche remarks from all three, the great lead in. Um, I think at the intersection of, of that, one of the emerging areas, I think is a, an interesting theme um, around ac academia and improving the digital and cyber mindset of the forces uh, is really around this this concept of human centered design, uh, you know, to, to Bob's point of these next generation of AI and how we use data and how we how we bring this space together. And then how do we apply you know, concepts of AR and VR in a very complex uh, and data centric uh, space, right? So uh, very interesting to, to see where that's gonna emerge over, over the coming years. Um, Rob, I'll, I'll, I'll pivot to you a little bit on that, maybe not as much on the AR, VR, but on the on the workforce side of it, you you talked a little bit about the new MOS, the new occupational series. What, what are you kind of thinking about of, of bringing in new talent, removing the barriers, uh, what are some of the challenges there from a workforce that you're you're particularly tackling right now in that space? It looks like we may have gotten a, a little bit freeze there with, uh, so why don't we pivot over uh, to Bob there. You, you touched a little bit on the human centered design and, and, and next ways to think about AI and ML and, and data and AR, VR. Uh, would you like to highlight some of those areas in a little bit more specificity? Sure, Bill. Sure. So, so let's go back to this idea of embracing automation and AI-enabled capabilities. You know, my sense is we need to move much more rapidly to transition what we call uh, typical cyber hygiene to some type of uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence engine. Uh, and there's lots of activities going on at the federal, state, local levels within industry. But we need to find ways to much more rapidly automate all the path of cyber defense. So, you know, from a data center perspective, uh, you know, I serve as the chief security officer at a global data center company. Um, you you work through a stock which has a lot of um, uh, routine uh, sysadmin functions. Those need to really be uh, automated so we can move human talent to much more active defense uh, measures. Um, so an illustration of where we started to work through that with gaming is Jack Voltaic. Jack Voltaic was an experimentation program sponsored by the Army Cyber Institute, which was really focused on this concept of user-driven requirements. And here we use gaming, uh, gaming activity to help us define what the framework should look like and working with big data lakes. Um, the data helped to inform the frameworks on how we would model uh, adversarial behavior and how we would move from that level to another level. So at one, at one, one capacity, it is going beyond just simple time motion study to impre improve um, workflow orchestration between humans, uh, humans as individuals, humans as te in team concepts, and humans and machines but taking it to a much higher readiness level. And this is what we're gonna need for our cyber command teams uh, over time. This is what we're trying to get to in the persistent cyber training environment is the ability to um, interactively improve cognition. So your readiness levels continue to get higher and your understanding of adversary tradecraft as well as your own blue tradecraft increases over time. VR and AR, especially in the remote environment, whether we're talking mixed reality, HoloLens 2, Microsoft type products, or cognitive services in general, allows you to do this, but you have to begin to work to move much more rapidly to take routine functions and move them to systems so that you can free up the human being to get to higher cognitive levels. Um, again, happy to go into other examples, Phil, but you know, at one level, that's, that's what I'm trying to get at. I think that's what a lot of folks are trying to get at as we try to drive forward um, in both uh, the cyber arena as well as in terms of improving overall military workforce readiness. That's great. And and Guy, I think uh, in some of our prep discussions, you highlighted some great work that you're doing in the AR, VR space. Again, if you, if you believe in the hypothesis that the digital workforce um, as a whole, a nation issue of how do we improve that? Things like AR, VR become really key, but 
you're doing some work, great work with DC3 and the Air Force and some others. Uh, if, if you wouldn't mind highlighting some of those, I think it'd be really germane to the audience here. Yeah, absolutely, Bill. And I'll, I'll jump on a little bit what um, Bob was talking about there in terms of improving the human cognition piece, because again, within the, within the center here, we've had several demonstrations. Uh, the teams that are working in the AR very, uh, area right now, uh, we've been working with the Air Force's team, both from 16th Air Force, AFCO, the Air Force Cryptologic Office, uh, uh, Air Force Lifecycle Management, who look at all of the platforms and weapon systems. And we've done several pretty pretty cool demonstrations in terms of, uh, and, and I think I'm pretty sure like uh, Chip Von Highlander and his team from AFCO, they're looking at these with several of the industry partners who are on this today, uh, but looking at how do we, how are we able to, to utilize this? And, and they've taken numerous, a couple different platforms and they show it there and talk about whether it be the cost savings of not actually having to get in an airplane or operate an airplane and, and those, but also saving that equipment and going in and doing work uh, on a box that if you actually pulled the wrong wire or, or hit the wrong button there, you're causing thousands of dollars worth of damage. And, and they, they actually walk you through. So if you haven't been through some of the demonstrations uh, that life cycle management and the others are doing, more interesting, or not more interesting, but in a non-traditional way, uh, one of my favorites uh, is uh, work being done by Dr. John Quarles here. Uh, John is looking at it from that human performance perspective, uh, looking at uh, why people like me, is, as soon as I put those goggles on within minutes, my human performance is being degraded. I am not very good at that. Uh, so sometimes it's as simple as John talks about putting that little reference point in there. Uh, normally, if I'm looking outside, that's called my nose, right? There's some fixed reference point that helps you from spatial disorientation and some of the effects we have from a human perspective. But he's also working on the monitoring piece of that. So we actually, whether it be on a Fitbit that you're wearing on your wrist, uh, but getting that feedback. And then the next part is to saying, let's look at how uh, not just we notify someone. And, and I did this in the flying world for years where we would go into the altitude chamber to what are those symptoms we start to see that if we're going to be have degraded performance that we're doing that. And then what do I do to combat those uh, to do that? And so John is working through that. One is identifying how people are, are, are affected by being in that virtual augmented world. Number two is giving that feedback. And then number three is how do we uh, sustain that or extend our performance and how do we do that? So it's some really neat work in that AR VR world uh, that we've started and we're doing a whole other hiring process here with our researchers and our teachers because I really think that's gonna be a big piece of the education that's out there and opportunities that are out there in the workforce with tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I think the main takeaway for the field is this is this is real and it's it's here now. We're uh, out of our cybersecurity center in Accenture, we're delivering some of these capabilities, certainly to startups that we'll showcase here a little bit later that we'll highlight that. And academia is a key piece of that to, to generate whether that's new algorithms or new technology. So it definitely, definitely awesome to see the kind of the Texas area really taking a leadership uh, role in that. Um, it looks like we have Rob back up. Uh, we might not have videos for him, but uh, I, I do want to go back on the, the workforce side of it. He talked to the new MOS, uh, where they were going with respect to workforce development in a very large ecosystem uh, of signal core officers, uh, cyber officers, if you will. Uh, Rob, anything you'd like to highlight there as far as key focus areas and continuing to grow the next gen cyber warrior? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So I, I touched a little bit earlier on uh, on the warrant officer and and bringing the uh, the new warrant officer into the army, the two fifty five Sierra. But uh, we have made changes in the army, and we continue to make changes uh, within the officer career field, the warrant officer career field, uh, as well as the enlisted career field. And, and the big takeaway here is, I, I guess there are two. One is we've realized that some of our old job specialties that we had soldiers for many many years. In 2020, we could combine those. Um, so, so the the conversation that we're having today about cybersecurity and uh, having a cyber capability is not just about growth alone. There may be growth in some areas, but the reality is that there are some uh, some industrial age positions that we realize we've got the smartest soldiers in the world, and and perhaps where many years ago we needed two different branches, two different specialties to perform one function. Now the reality is. We could have one uh, one extremely smart American soldier perform that function, uh, which then frees up a capacity to begin to look at the cyber defensive piece that 
frankly, previously we, we didn't need to because our adversary didn't drive us to have to concern ourselves as much with a defensive capability. So whether we're merging MOSs, creating the war officers, the new officers, uh, or the enlisted job specialties for 2020, um, all of those, uh, in addition to promotion. Promotion is, uh, uh, the Army is taking a hard look and it frankly is beginning to already move in a direction of not necessarily having an individual wait uh, for promotion based upon time uh, in position. But if you have the, the the skills and abilities, and you've been and you've demonstrated that you're a top tier leader, then the army is now promoting those individuals at a faster rate uh, in 2020 than we were uh, just a few short years ago. Uh, the final piece that I'd like to mention with regard to, to the workforce is, is project inclusion, and so project inclusion, which is is uh, bits and pieces have been in the news over the past couple of weeks. But in terms of having the diversity, which really what you're looking for is the diversity of thought, and we can come back to that a little bit later on. Uh, but in order to have that diversity that you want at the higher levels that then will generate some of that diversity of thought, we're now actually removing um, photos from our promotion board packets because we want to promote based upon merit and not based upon a, prom uh, uh, a photo. We're removing names and the gender uh, specific information because again we want to promote based upon proficiency and everything else. Uh, so when you look at where we have come with regard to the ability to stand up new career fields, the ability to relook the way in which we are promoting, attracting, and retaining talent, uh, I'm really excited to to be a part of um, what the Army is doing within the cyber realm as well as the other career fields. Very good, and uh, for those of the audience who may not be aware, the, the recent presidential order of kind of pushing for skills and I'll call them micro-credentials over uh, diplomas. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out, but that's, that's another lane uh, I think is really interesting. And um, may go back to Guy here in a minute about where he sees micro-credentialing going in, in in the college and university. I think that'll be key, but I, I wanted to kind of shift a little bit into the innovation tech insertion and kind of the as a service, whether that's cyber as a service or, or managed IT. Um, Cause I, I think we're truly at a time where the entire department and federal space is really making this big pivot to as a service models. The army and the air force certainly are. Uh, you could argue the Navy has been somewhat in that model for a while. The, the amount of commercial integration of platforms, uh, new policies on supply chain and, you know, government ownership, commercial ownership of equipment, the new DevSecOps kinds of pushes. Um, so, so, Guy, let me let me push over to you. I mean, you, you live at that intersection, as we've talked about. Um, what, do, what do you see as some of the key themes that we've got to work through uh, to better tie the knots for, like, the startups that are on the line today, the academic institutions, uh, certainly great work with, with RELIS and UTSA and NSCC. But what are some of the things that, that you'd recommend from kind of you're a startup to a large business that, that we ought to tackle? Yeah, so um, let, let me uh, cage this again, because I'm, I'm not coming from an industry perspective, but really about uh, from, from the academic perspective right now. But but how do we bring that together with the industry, whether it be the, the small uh, and, and startups and, and where it was discussed earlier this morning, where a lot of the innovation is happening uh, to the folks uh, and to the uh, defense industrial base that, that the DOD and our federal partners rely on quite a bit. Uh, the first part is really about our three primary focus areas of the NSCC, uh, right? It's about we need to change education in the U.S., and we're trying to lead some of that in terms of building world-class education that is actually meeting in these areas, right? Uh, so that's part of the first thing. As, as, as most of the folks know, UTSA has been uh, rated as the top uh, uh, one of the top universities in cybersecurity at, the, uh, at each of the levels, at the bachelor's level, at the master's program, and others there. Uh, but it's really more than that. It's about changing a lot of what we're doing at the university and academic world to really interdisciplinary and uh, cross-disciplinary and transdisciplinary. And the reason that's important is because, as, as Bill was just mentioning, if you're talking about supply chain uh, and business type uh, processes, you have to understand that, but you have to understand the background that uh, becomes in that. So that's one of the keys in terms of our focus here uh, is, is to really look at, and I would say this is happening throughout UT systems. It is certainly happening uh, with uh, Steve Cambone and Mark Welsh and 
the folks who are up at uh, Texas A&M at the Rellis campus, but really looking at that. The second part is, as you brought up, is how do we bring that piece of it, the, the research, advancing research. That's both at the foundational level and at the applied level. There is a lot of research that goes on at the applied level in the industry areas, but in all honesty, a lot of the big uh, major uh, changes and the transformational changes are going to be with foundational scientists. And so what I, what I encourage folks is, uh, especially you know whether big business, small business, when we're talking about building and doing your business development models, look at what your investment is in research. Research is what's going to get, whether it be your uh, services or your products, to sell themselves. And, and, and building that concept is that uh, they can sell themselves. But part of my business development really needs to be how much I'm doing and doing that, whether it be with uh, uh, hiring and bringing on internships who are working in these areas uh, or very simply in terms of working in a collaborative function, such as the NSCC, uh, such as the ones that are out in, in the other organizations uh, in Colorado Springs and others. And I think there's some great work going on at UT Austin. As, as you know, uh, uh, it was recently in the papers that the University of Texas Systems, which includes UT Dallas, UT Austin, UTSA down here, uh, was one of the top three uh, producers of new IP intellectual property and patents uh, in the world. And that was a global thing in terms of having U.S. patents. Uh, so I think that'll be key there in terms of uh, what I encourage folks to do is to, to look at in your business development, your business analysis, what you're doing in, in advancing the research piece that the last piece I'll bring up is what we need to do in the academic area, and it goes back to the education, and that is really addressing the workforce. Very particularly here, uh, over our, our goal, Taylor Amy has made it clear, we will, we will triple the size of our input and throughput of our folks through the School of Data Science across four different colleges to do that. But I will tell you here at UTSA, is, it, it's of interest, more than 90% of our students are fully clearable. We are also a predominantly female organization here. We have a uh, 5149, and we really encourage that STEM uh, across with, uh, and getting folks in, in, in the, into our community here from the female side, and that's an important piece there. So it's really how we uh, address and bring in the, the broader communities and culture uh, to address the challenges that are faced by both our small industry and our larger industry groups. Very good. Could, couldn't agree with you more, Guy. That, that, that whole of, of government, industry, academia is, is what it's all about. And I think the investments we're all making uh, across the board, we can we can continue to improve that piece. Um, we're, we're about at the 30 minute mark. I was going to pivot over. We did. We don't have many questions, so please keep the questions coming in. Uh, but we've, I've got a couple here. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave this open. I think any any of you could 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 address this one. So I'll let you chime in. But uh, the question is, adversaries have implemented AI, ML, machine learning deep, using deep fake uh, in this arena. And what actions should industry and government design uh, to counter this approach to to affect the human factors? I mean, I, I think we all realize deep fake is a is a real thing. It's in 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 the seconds and minutes of reality now. And so, from a cyber defense, cybersecurity, I think this is where this is going is like, how do we bring together the startups, the, the academia, the other aspects, and the, the operational nature of this to to, to bring to, to basically fin this off, this fin this real threat off. So Bob, maybe I maybe I start with you if you don't yep. mind. Talking about it. Yep. So so in this space, I mean, there's several threads to pull on. Defensively, uh, it starts with where a guy is. We have to educate uh, consumers on what is going on. Uh, there is a challenge in people um, not realizing that they're being exploited. Um, so this concept of identity exploitation and control by adversaries is real. It's not just uh, one election, um, it's going to be, and not just one democratic process, it's really uh, pervasive now. So at one level, it's education. At another level, it's really understanding and, and uh, from an advantage point of what, what that looks like. So it's, it's the data again, right? So it's social media, it's IoT uh, sensing information, um, it is other personally identifiable information, and it's information that adver adversaries have stolen that they can now exploit in conjunction with all of those different pieces to include advertising tech, botnet type technology. So understanding uh, the realm of, where, of what is going on with deep fake and uh, identity ex exploitation is step one. Secondly then is we have to figure out a way of understanding 
who's doing it, how is it, how is it being done? So enhanced attribution, DARPA's got programs in this space, looking at ways um, that we can generate new insights by building the models, right? These adversarial behavior models need to go from strictly cyber models into uh, cognitive models, right? Which is where they're, they're, it's all about influence, right? And it's all about countering influence. Once we have a sense of how, how those models are built is then to use those models to understand thresholds for uh, preempting uh, deep fakes and creating correct narratives. There's also alternative strategies with regards to helping folks to understand how to compete in this space. So, so to me, it's a building block approach that includes uh, new types of intelligence. It includes a different way of thinking about operations. And the only way, the only way to get this done is through a very tight collaboration with uh, industry experts in this space. Uh, and again, it's not just your traditional defense industrial based companies. It's certainly that it's cloud infrastructure providers, ISPs. It is also advertising tech with government uh, and academia to make this happen. I'll, I'll end there and let, let others make some comments. Oh, great rundown. All right, uh, our, our second question here is, uh, and maybe I'll, I'll aim this one to Guy, because it's a, uh, and Bob may uh, provide some supporting fires. It's really around, you know, this, this matrix of academia, industry, uh, and government, you know, Futures Command, Air Force, Air Army, Cyber Commands, um, huge tech base in this area, academia. Yeah, how, how do we overlay this matrix in the South Texas area um, to really make this real? And I think a part of that, I think you were getting to this, guy, is that tech injection, that startup piece. How do we better tie that? Because I, I know the one challenge, you know, large companies have like like an Accenture is how do you get that startup that really um, can help you scale to the next level? That's really innovative of, of connecting those dots together and getting to speed. Uh, in seconds and versus minutes, kind of kind of aspect. So, how how would you overlay those two together uh, with the need for speed, certainly in cyber and and the matrix that we've got down here? Yeah. So so let me start maybe by a little bit of of patting you on the back, Bill and, and Bob, very particularly in this case, in, in in what you're doing today, and the fact that we're having this dialogue today, and that we follow, and you know, having the previous uh, um, uh, briefs over the last couple of days with Army Futures Command and bringing in Tim Hawk and bringing in the different aspects of, uh, of what's happening and bringing that together. So, so today is part of that solution that you talked about. Uh, and, and, and that has been a focus that I know Bob has worked with with us every time we've sat down, working with the different uh, organizations uh, that are focused on, whether it be DOD, military and veterans community that exists up in Austin. And I see those coming together and I see a lot of the uh, I'm going to call it the connectivity that's happened. And again, thanks to uh, a lot of the folks that are out here. I think to your point, uh, we need to continue that flow with the industry type pieces here because there are very particularly, I'll say, nuances. And 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 we we need to start stressing what the opportunities are uh, rather than the differences. Uh, there will certainly be the, that competitive edge in terms of between uh, the different organizations. But I really do think that if you look at how well what is going on here in San Antonio, uh, and whether that be with uh, you know the the community type aspects, whether it be with Fort San Antonio and the larger Joint Base San Antonio, and what's happening in Austin in terms of extremely great innovation in terms of what Army is doing with Army Futures Command. Don't forget that and tied to Army Futures Command right down here in San Antonio, you have Army North headquarters. If you've been watching the news a couple of days in terms of bringing the operational piece. Uh, you've watched how they've been actually running a lot of the support of the uh, defense support to, uh, to civilian authorities and bringing a lot of the logistics, a lot of the health care. Uh, and that's not just here to uh, in yesterday's news. I think it was on Dallas and San Antonio of moving those forces, doing the logistics, moving that to support under the COVID-19. But they've been doing that all over the country in terms of that. So bringing together what I'll say, the operational piece that occurs down here with uh uh, Army North and what's happening in the and where we need to go in the future is really coming together and a lot of it is really done or, or based on what we're doing here today and bring it together today virtually uh, but as we move forward even bringing uh, some of that transportation we got to start driving up and down the road I think not that the roads aren't crowded enough but uh, uh, to get that dialogue and continue it on the industry side just as it is on the DOD side. 
Yeah, so we've got about five minutes left. I, I did want to pass the, I'll call it the, the the Army strategic lane over to to Rob for a second before we do wrap ups. But, but Rob, it certainly forces command with a huge uh, inject in the in the cyber operational field and the emergence uh, of Army Futures Command. If, if you would mind touching on at those strategic relationships and where some of those opportunities may be heading. Um, uh, definitely appreciate the and and in essence to follow up with uh, uh, with what uh, the, the other panel members have just mentioned uh, there's been a call in, in my opinion there's been a cultural shift in the army over the last few years and that cultural shift really has us listening um, listening so that we can uh, at the end of the day have a whole of government approach. Uh, as we as you've already listened as you've already listed you, you've got army north uh, Futures Command, San Antonio. But if I come back to Futures Command for just a moment, that was a deliberate decision to stand at Army headquarters, not on a traditional, not on an Army installation. So when we look at conversations about the whole of government approach, working with industry, all of us collaborating together, um, the biggest takeaway here is that uh, we are here, we are, we realize what our strengths are, we realize what our weaknesses are, and we realize that we can't all do it alone. And you've got a uh, a, a tremendous, uh, when I say you, you're for the majority are, are in the Texas area right now. There, there is huge potential in that area. Uh, we, we've already taken the leap to put our money where our mouth is, if you will. It's not just lip service, the headquarters, plural, are there. And, and we look forward to a continued partnership, knowing full well that we cannot do it alone. Outstanding. So as we uh, we wrap up, I'll, I'll do a little bit of an ad hoc question as we, we close out for closing. But uh, for the panelists, if, if there was one big thing you could get done in the in the next uh, fiscal year, next calendar year, what would that be? And what what impact do you think you'd have have on this community? Guy, I'll, I'll pass the baton to you first. Yeah, so uh, let me, and I just want to follow up with what Rob said. I think it was visionary, the idea of saying, hey, uh, Austin is bringing some amazing stuff in terms of innovation, and let's just not keep putting everything, and I'll, I'll use the term San Antonio, Military City USA, but let's really try to expand that. And, and I really do think over the next year, if we can bring these together in terms of what is happening in Austin area, what is happening in Texas, that will have a united voice for Texas to be able to compete on the national and global level in terms of, of, of what we're doing, whether it be the national security, whether it be in the AR, VR, all those areas. Uh, and so, so that's what I'd say. I'd say is we have made some great strides forward uh, to be able to unite and do that voice. And that is happening at the state level. Uh, you know, and, and we've had that discussion with Bob Butler and DIR uh, and the folks that are doing that. We've had it at the city level, uh, working with the mayor here. Uh, and we've had it at the military level with uh, uh, with General Hawk, uh, with uh, General Murray and General Richardson up there, General Richardson down here uh, as well with uh, Army North. So so being able to bring that together over the next year, if we can continue the momentum that's been started there, uh, I, I think that that that'd be the biggest thing we could accomplish over the next year. Outstanding. Bob? Yeah, I think uh, um, what uh, what what uh, Guy was just talking about um, it makes great sense uh, for me. You know, looking at Jack Voltaic, looking at the pandemic, it's highlighted the need for bottom up local community state work to connect with top down federal uh, work, and we need to converge in that space faster. So, if you think about the audience that we have on today, it's an ecosystem, right? You've got folks that rep that are in the government, that represent the government. They're driving requirements. They need to help us with changing uh, policy, industrial policy, and they need to be involved with the acquisition side. Uh, in terms of the solution providers, you know, the next group, that's entrepreneurs, that's labs, that's academia, uh, need to be much more engaged in converging with the requirements folks. But they are also, from a business perspective, need to understand what drives business. And so folks in private equity, venture capital, they need to be heavily engaged in this triad relationship as we're going forward in time. So, so what I would seek to do in, in conjunction with the article that I wrote and the points that Frank and I laid out, we have to tighten up. And I think we've got a, a great uh, ecosystem in South Central Texas to 
to kind of pilot and pathfind this for the nation, we have to tighten those three legs of the triad together. The, 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 the financing side, again, private equity, family offices, um, large firm capital, um, as well with entrepreneurs, labs, academia. And then the third piece, which drives the whole process, is the requirements coming from the military and the government. And uh, if we can create a flywheel, and tighter and tighter collaboration in that space, then we're going to get we're going to close risk exposure and gain advantage. Outstanding. Thanks, Rob. I know we're running out of time, but I want to I want to get your final take as well. well. Based upon the introduction, when you said a little bit earlier that you don't know if, if it's more difficult being a CIO or being a CIO of an operational student, I'm going to be a little myopic in in my in my response to the question about what I'd like to see over the next year. Um, so. So what I really would, would uh, like to, to see would be the use of AI and machine learning to assist the Army in building readiness. Now, uh, we, we spend a lot of time, hundreds of thousands of soldiers are all involved in the national defense, the Army's contribution to national defense. And when we take a look at what it takes to defend the nation, we do believe to agree that we can leverage, um, harness, um, AI, machine learning to assist us in building the right amount of readiness, the right amount of national uh, defense uh, at the right time. Yeah, I, I, you said it was tactical. I think that that's probably as strategic as it gets right there. I think that's <laughs> in this. So uh, again, thanks to the panel on behalf of Accenture and Accenture Federal. Uh, hopefully everybody got a, a little bit of the melting pot in, in the Texas area and how we're bringing, again, industry, academia, uh, all the aspects of government and federal and the startups together. Uh, hopefully you'll stay on for the showcase here to follow up in a few minutes. Uh, but again, thank you to all the panel here, Guy, Bob, and Rob. Uh, appreciate your time today and, and shedding some some great wisdom for the team here. And please don't hesitate for those in the audience to, to follow up if there's anything uh, we can assist with. With that, I'll hand it back over to Julie.